talk will be in two halves. So we'll have a, a couple of minutes break in between the two sections, just to get yourself another cup of tea or a glass of water or even some crisps, you know, whatever you want. So I'm going to hand over to Crow now. Nice. Can you guys see my actual presentation and not like the speaker notes that I have? Yeah. Good. Nice. All right. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Abby for hosting us. Thank you for the four years of sharing your homework. I could not have passed my degree without it. Um, it was great, but yeah, well, today I'm doing a talk on POC Squared, which is something I co-founded and the importance of, again, just science ethics in academia in general. So first of all, just to introduce our team, um, there's me, obviously, Carell. I'm a co-founder of POC Squared. Currently, I'm an astrophysics PhD student at the University of Nottingham. Um, my research focuses on black holes, AGN, and galaxy evolution. Um, next, we have Seha. She isn't actually here today. She wasn't able to make it, but she's the other co-founder of POC Squared, and currently, she's an R&D consultant. And then finally, we have Prithvi, who's going to be talking after me after our little mini break. Um, and she's a contributor to POC Squared, but it just helps out so much in every way. And she's a particle physics PhD student at the University of Liverpool. Um, she works on supernova relic neutrinos. I don't really know what they are, but it sounds cool. So there you go. Um, so just to give an overview of what POC Squared is, um, basically we're like an activist group slash social enterprise. And we were founded in 2018. Uh, we do a lot of different things, but the overall goal is to improve uh, the diversity in STEM academia, and we particularly focus on the um, ethnic diversity in the mathematical sciences, because uh, that's an area that's severely like lacking and lagging behind other subjects. Um, so after several years of like so purely self-motivated and funded work, we were finally able to secure like real money from the Royal Astronomical Society for our outreach efforts. So along with um, along the way, we've been featured in The Guardian. Um, Prithvi and I became contributing columnists at Physics World magazine, uh, which is published by the Institute of Physics. And Prithvi specifically has written for the Association of British Science Writers. So that's where you can find us like around the web outside of our specific website if you want to look for us. So just to talk about our goals and sort of where we came from, essentially POC Squared started off as like a support group, group among our friends at uni, which is where we actually met Abby, like she said, uh, we all did our degree and masters together. Um, essentially we all found university to be like really tough on us. Our physics degree was very full on. We had loads of lectures, lots of coursework, lots of projects, usually all at the same time. And almost all of the undergrads were forced to do like crazy hours. We, you know, consistently work weekends and we'd be in uni like for 12 hours. Like we've done several 60 hour weeks. And looking back, we realized how unfair our university treated us, especially as an undergrad. And like, um, even at the time, amongst all of the garbage, we knew something wasn't right. So um, on top of this, um, as people of colour specifically, we noticed how lacking the curriculum was. Like thinking about science, we, we realised, you know, anyone can do science. And it just didn't make sense that throughout our entire degree, or, you know, 60 hours for four years, there was like a grand total of two scientists of colour mentioned, and it just didn't make any sense to us. And then like when learning about the other scientists, like the general ones that we were supposed to learn about, um, they, you know, they all turned out to be like massively bigoted and the general consensus from academics were they were smart. So we just ignore it or we're just using their science without any kind of like second thought about how their terrible views did like impact the work that they did. Um, and there was like nothing to like mitigate that and how they were teaching us. Um, on top of this, when we were looking to continue in the field, because many of us wanted to be scientists, which makes sense, you know, why else do a physics degree? Um, we found it massively difficult to find out how to actually move on after our masters. Um, how to get a funded PhD or any kind of scientific job was never made clear. And when uh, looking at anyone who wasn't an undergrad, they were all mysteriously white, which particularly stood out at our uni because the uni we went to did have like a halfway decent um, BAME undergrad population. So um, 
yeah, it was just really, really stark how little the paid people in the institution didn't reflect the undergraduate population. So, one second, let me get a drink. So yeah, so after trying and failing to get help the usual way, you know, we did try the EDI team, we did go to the careers team, you know, those were like our first thoughts. Um, and we did, and we just came out with nothing um, <coughs> at the end. Uh, we quickly realized that the problems we were facing were in fact like systematic and not unique to us, which is like good and bad, I suppose, but whatever. Um, so then out of sort of like sheer desperation, we eventually started working on making the help like we needed ourselves, which is essentially how a lot of like outreach and activism efforts end up going. Um, so the first of our goals is to work on getting like marginalized people into paying jobs in STEM academia. So specifically like PhD and above. Um, this is um, arguably our biggest focus because as we, we find the sort of masters to PhD gap to be like a key issue that isn't addressed. Many outreach groups and universities are like working with sort of like younger people to get them into to start a degree, which is fine. But um, to, they, you know, you, universities do gain something from doing that. They get like nine thousand two hundred and fifty pounds per year per student when you, you know, get more undergrads. So there's a monetary gain. But like, if you look at PhD students, like getting from masters to PhD, there's like no such care is taken. Um, again, there is just, they're just almost exclusively white and it only gets worse the further you up, go up in the career ladder. And if you want to increase diversity, you can't just like stop at undergrads and you have to realize that people need money to pay their bills. So uh, we're trying to address like systematic problems that hinder vain people from progressing so they can actually have a sustainable like scientific career um we also work to actively decolonize stem curriculums as well so much science that is like literally mathematically correct that happens to originate from the global south has been just ignored and omitted from mainstream curriculums due to the bias in those who decided uh, what we learn um and there's also that problem I mentioned before in that the classical scientists were just terrible people and they actively made their science worse on top of it. And this is never taken into account. Um, and that doesn't make for an objective view of what should be an objective science. So um, eventually we would like there to be some kind of like regular review of the higher education curriculum to avoid and remove these issues. And we're working towards like getting that to actually happen. And then finally, more on our outreach side, we uh, like to promote the achievements of those whose work we uh, generally don't get to hear about. Um, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but it essentially serves as motivation for us and it serves as, you know, um, motivation and representation for others. And it gives us ideas on how we can, again, just remove any sort of systematic problems and just decentralize decentralized whiteness from science so that people of color whose work is literally right isn't just being randomly ignored so um just to talk more about our actual outreach and less about our activism just because it's a bit more interesting uh, one thing we are especially proud of is our monthly podcast um it's on science ethics like this talk so we have a bit of a theme going um and we've just started season two. Again, we got like money for once from our funding. So now we were able to do that. Uh, each episode has a particular focus where we'll talk about like our experiences and then we'll broaden out to like general problems in the field. And finally, we'll suggest like actual practical solutions for people to use in their own departments. And everything we say is like backed up by really like strong evidence um, and we'll have examples of like things that you can do in our show notes that Prithvi curates for every episode and she does a really good job of it. And we also have a transcript for every single episode if you're hard of hearing or if you just want to read instead of listen to us or whatever else. Um, and also every episode ends on the good note because we also recommend some kind of media, 
be it like a book, a TV show, a film, a YouTube channel, whatever else that's made or featured, a, made by or features a person of colour to once again like promote their work because they just, you just don't hear about it. Um, so past episodes include why the Athena Swan Charter is like a garbage mess. Um, we also talked about like climate activism and how like being vegan is a completely fine personal choice, but is not the be all and end all of climate activism. And we also had a mini interview series on how to get an actual paying job in STEM. And just to put our money where our mouth is, we paid the people with our own money who came on the podcast before we got funding because outreach is just taken for granted all over the place. Um, so outside of this podcast, we do have like a website, www.pocsquared.co.uk, it's on the screen. Um, and that's where we just put everything we do. Um, we have a massive resources page for anyone to look at that put feeds, like puts so many hours into. It has a bunch of links to like studies, books, talks. Most of them are free. You know, a couple of the books you do have to buy, but everything else is free. And it's all on like different types of marginalized groups in STEM. And it's great because it has like all of the information, all the data that you'll need if you want to use it for yourself to like put in a talk or for your EDI meetings and stuff like that. So we're extremely proud of it. And please go and have a look if you want to use it. Because again, we just um, we just curate it. And as and when we see it, we'll put it on that page. So it's constantly updated. And then finally, we have a blog. And this is what I was talking about a minute ago. It primarily focuses on people of color in STEM, the work they did. Um, despite or were able to do despite the several barriers they face and it also talks about like experiments done in like the global south that you just don't hear about and how uh, well they're doing despite generally having less funding and stuff like that and it also features some other stuff that we're extremely proud of one thing is that we did a review of like a BBC article that was extremely condescending towards um, a bunch of the scientists who happened to be Indian women who were involved in the Mars Orbiter mission. And also you can see like a dying Squidworth on the screen right now. This is actually something that's on our website. We wrote a whole guide on how to um, get a fully funded PhD in STEM. Um, most of us were like the first or one of the first people in our families to go to university. So like, there's nobody to ask on how to do this and universities just don't tell you. Um, th this is like a one page screenshot as well on the page, but it's like 10 pages, but it gives you all of the information you should need on like the application process, like how to write a personal statement, how to format your CV and just the other things that we found out along the way that you just don't get told unless you know somebody who's been through the process. And yeah, essentially for this blog, we hired and paid undergrads um, to, you know, give undergrads some money because nobody just, nobody pays them for anything. Um, we used our RAS grant to do that. And there's some really cool people on there and they did a really great job. And again, we're just all about paying people for their efforts. So we didn't get anybody to write for that blog until we could afford to pay them, which is what we did. So yeah, please go and have a look at that if you want to see what's on there as well. And I'd really recommend it. So that's like the first half of this talk. Again, we're going to have like a little break right now and whilst Pripfi sets up. But yeah, and hold any questions you have until the end. Thank you. Hello. Oh, crap, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you so, so much for that. And also, I just want to emphasize that the resources that um, these guys have collected are incredibly um, useful. Um, I use them, I genuinely use them all the time. It's great because it feels like uh, they're paying me back with the whole homework exchange years, years later. <laughs> so it's wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, so um, if we another couple of minutes and then we should be uh, good to go, right? Mm. Good. I'm going to go ahead and get some water, so I'll be back in a minute. Okay, all right. Cool. Um, so do remember that if you have any questions or comments, um, either hold them to the end or by all means put them in the chat if you uh, don't want to go live on camera and we're happy to compare them for you. Um, also, uh, if, if there's anything else or any information that you guys would like to see again, um, please let us know. Um, 
uh, the resources like uh, like Carl said are available on their website and also they are on Twitter too so you can give them a follow um, I will be uh, retweeting their account after the um, after the event or not retweeting their account linking you guys to their account thank you yeah. <laughs> still don't know how to work so <laughs> after thank you time. thank you Okay, so um, yeah, should I, uh, when should I share my screen? Give it a couple of minutes? Yeah, or? yeah I know, give it an hour, that's fine. Just, okay. Carl can just, just wait. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> bye Carl, it's my turn. Um, <laughs> away. <laughs> She's just gone, it's fine. <laughs> you ready okay cool cool okay so let me just share my screen okay uh so first of all thank you abby for this um like opportunity to talk uh thank you the audience for being here to listen to this talk um and yeah thank you Krell, for like the uh amazing first half of our presentation um so the section I'm basically going to be focusing on now is uh, about our particular personal sort of experiences in STEM academia and these experiences that might be um, common to other people of colour, minority groups in STEM. And yeah, I hope that um, so there's some of them somewhat resonate with you. Um, so our first uh, point here is basically just the complete um, lack of diversity and uh, just a proper like uh, yeah lack of representation uh, both throughout the curriculum that we were taught in undergrad and also um, looking when when we were looking at the uh, uh, like the roster of staff um, so yes in particular uh, the lack of uh, BAME and especially women of color postdocs and professors in our department. Um, back in undergrad, we had a we had several white women professors um, and a couple of male uh, BAME lecturers, but there were really no women of color in the faculty at any high academic uh, position. Um, and yeah, it was it was it's it's a little upsetting when you think about it um, that that no women of color sort of taught me throughout my entire like academic career um uh but that's something that we at PSC squared are trying to change uh the second point is that we face several moments, um and we face them so, sort of from like majority sort of white male uh, cohort uh, a lot of these were sort of uh kind of um offensive like jokes and quotation marks so uh, a lot of comments about um, sort of asking if I was lost in the department, uh, kind of pointedly as if like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, and something else that we've learned from um, other women of color and it's actually quite common, especially if you are like older, is that women of color are often mistaken for like cleaning staff and, admin and people in administrative positions. And that's something that we found when talking to other uh, women of color from different organizations as well. Uh, so that's something which is a which is a big problem, and it's just it's just so it's rude, and it's something that needs to uh, change. Oh, I'm just skipping ahead here. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm just gonna not not entirely sure what's happened here. Okay. Oh. Okay. I think we're back to where we should be. Right. Um, so the third point um, I want to bring up uh, with regards to personal experiences is the drinking culture. Um, and it's not immediately obvious as to why this is not uh, massively inclusive. Um, but a big thing in academia is is the drinking culture that surrounds like after lectures or conferences etc and it often happens to the detriment of inclusiveness um 
a lot of socializing happens uh, in pubs, especially with lecturers and students who cannot drink slash enter a place where alcohol is served uh, due to, for example, religion or health issues, etc., can feel isolated slash left out. Uh, back in undergrad, for example, we had a couple of Muslim friends who couldn't enter places where alcohol was served. And as a result, they had to miss out on a lot of uh, really key social events. And so many physics society events seem to be pub crawls. And that's something which is often times the gateway like entry point for a lot of undergraduate students uh, who are wanting to socialize with other members with other students in, in the department um, and the fact that it's centered around alcohol is sort of kind of exclusionary um, also if you uh, happen to have any problems regarding addiction or any sort of like disabilities um, uh, regarding uh, alcohol and alcohol consumption, you might not feel like you want to enter a pub. And that's something which uh, can sort of gatekeep a lot of socializing in academia, which isn't good. Um, and uh, a, third, a fourth point, I think, which is quite, quite key to the PhD experience in particular, um, is traveling for conferences. Uh, for example, I work on the Super Kamiokande experiment in Japan. And I frequently used to have to travel for um, big collaboration meetings. Um, travel can be a fun and exciting part of a PhD. You get to meet physicists from all over, all over the world and get hands-on um, experience at, sorry, at, experiment, at experimental sites and do some sightseeing as well, which is really fun. I'm not knocking that. What is less mentioned is how sometimes the emphasis on travel can be hard for people who are disabled or have chronic health issues or have caring duties they can't neglect to just up and just leave to another part of the world. <laughs> um, uh, there will often times also dietary requirements and uh, health and religious issues that can also be uh, conflicting with like certain cultures and certain parts of the world. And these are problems um, which aren't really talked about when it comes to travel. Um, and another thing that I want to bring up is that there are literally parts of the world which don't, where people who live there don't, um, aren't massively accepting to people of different racial backgrounds. Um, and for example, there are places in rural areas of China and Japan where they may not have even seen a real, like a, a dark skinned black person in real life. And there have been reports of travelers traveling in these places where they will purposely like stare or take photos of um, dark skinned people of color. And this is just like a threat that, you know, a graduate student might actually face, a real one might face when they go traveling for conferences and stuff, especially considering how a lot of experimental sites are often in um, remote locations due to the need for like space for the, for like the test site, et cetera. So yeah, a lot of big experiments happen to be in very rural parts of the world. Um, Super Camera Kande is in Kamioka and Gifi Pre Prefecture, which is like a tiny little like remote town in the mountains um and the other side of the experiments in Tokai which is like also uh quite far away from like uh like a, a central city like Tokyo it's it's near the coast so yeah these are quite rural places and I'm assuming it's the same for a lot of other um experiment uh, experimental institutions in the world and uh it can be hard to travel there and feel included um so that's that's the travel point uh, covered. Uh, we also um, specifically with look, regarding our work at PSC Squared relating to EDI initiatives, uh, we've encountered a lot of bad EDI teams, <laughs> bad equality, diversity, and inclusion teams. For those of you who don't know what EDI stands for, um, so yeah, well, this has been this has been interesting. Um, so for starters, like a lot of these EDI teams are primarily made of white women, or it's just a sole woman of color in the faculty doing all the work. Uh, this isn't true diversity. And this is where a lot of the problems with intersectionality in STEM stems from. Um, at one time during our undergrad, we had an awful uh, long table meeting with one of the academics um, who I should state was a white woman at old institution who, when we asked about focusing on intersectionality and focusing on perhaps um, the, you know, in, inclusive, in, the inclusionary um, 
parts of uh, diversity. She said that uh, we are first focusing on women and then we're focusing on race. Um, and you can obviously see how this is quite a problematic statement. It sort of implies that uh, inclusion is hierarchical when it really isn't. And true inclusivity would look at all of these things at once. And this is a uh, this is something which is quite common with a lot of mainstream EDI initiatives. Uh, for example, the Athena Swan Charter made intersectionality an option when it came to filling out the paperwork. Um, and then there was the recently developed Race Equality Charter, which hasn't been anywhere near as widely adopted as Athena Swan, despite coming out a few years ago now. Um, and you could, and this is quite clearly a problem. It just shows that race and racial equality isn't being valued as widely as gender equality, even though the two obviously intersect. You can be a woman and you can be a person of color. Like that's something that can happen, but these EDI initiatives tend to break it down a lot, which is really unfair. Uh, and um, yeah, the problem with a lot of these uh, the initiatives is that they're very top down. Um, i.e. universities can sort of get a gold star when they fulfill some of these criteria. True equality movements have been and always will be grassroots movements. And the most important thing any EDI team can do is to actively aim to implement the changes that marginalized students and faculty members are bringing up and not do, you know, not slap on a, you know, Athena Swan or Juno or whatever badge for clout, like act actually listen to your students and the changes they want to make. Um, and to sort of finish this slide off, uh, this is sort of going to focus on looking ahead and looking at the problems with um, certain aspects of higher academia, for example, uh, postdocs. Um, so something that's been very apparent to both Corral and myself is that postdocs are difficult to obtain and difficult to have as a job. The fact that postdocs can be so short term involve a lot of moving from institution to institution and are so work heavy. I don't know a single postdoc who's kept nine to five hours. It's so incredibly disheartening. Also, the pay is not anywhere equivalent to um, the amount of work that postdoctoral researchers often put in. They're, they're oftentimes just seen as like disposable fodder, right? Um, and they just don't get paid enough. <laughs> and now more than ever, the need for adequate pay, funding and job security is vitally important. And the idea of a postdoc just running out during a pandemic is absolutely just frightening. Oh, all of these conditions sort of mean that though only those who are the most privileged are able to hold down a postdoctoral appointment for any long amount of time. Um, or until they become a professor. For a lot of working class individuals and minorities, um, it just isn't a viable option uh, long-term, which is uh, really, really upsetting. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next slide now. Um, so this slide is going to focus on uh, the concept of free labor when it comes to EDI work and why this is a bad thing. Um, so the vast majority of the time, EDI work is not compensated at all, especially if you are a graduate student. Um, most academics on EDI teams aren't compensated and a lot of the time the workload is foisted upon the shoulders of the white women um, or sole women of color in the department. Uh, it's extremely damaging to the quality of resources produced by EDI teams and because of the emotional intensity at times of the work, because you know, it, is, it is emotional labor, talking about this stuff isn't easy. Um, it can be very difficult to want to continue being part of this team. Um, uh, last, in the last section, Corel mentioned how we, um, myself and her, are both uh, writers for Physics World. And um, something that I just want to tell you right now is that we were asked to write for them for free until we specifically asked to get paid. And this, this is bad. This is really just, um, <laughs> it's an awful thing. Like this is a multi-million you know, pound institution um, and we are two graduate students and they didn't pay us until we specifically asked them to. And that's kind of messed up. So I think free labor in academia should just not be a thing. Um, especially when it comes to EDI work. Um, and yeah, the second point I want to make here is that uh, this work is often crucial for the mental health and general well-being of students and faculty members. 
who are parts who are part of marginalized groups. Without this lifeline, it's difficult to know who to turn to for help. And going to a central well-being team at the university is often very time consuming and inefficient. Therefore, individual departmental EDI teams need actual funding and the people on them need compensation for their work. Oh, um, what did I get to? Okay, so in my personal experience, um, being on EDI teams is difficult, not only because of the uh, lack of resources and funding, but oftentimes the backlash from white women slash male peers on the team, especially as a person of color, is a a lot of it is actively unhelpful and tries to shoot down any um, change that you, any active change that uh, you want to make. Um, this is why it's important to have more marginalized uh, uh, people on the team, on the EDI team, instead of just having some, uh, just having the occasional postdoc professor who happens to be of a minority group. Um, it just means that the ideas that you bring to the table are like truly diverse and can better represent the needs of the student and faculty body. Um, so finally, I think I'm gonna like just end on some positive things here because I know a lot of what I've talked about has been kind of negative. Um, uh, but the reason this work has been so important and so uplifting uh, for myself and Corel and Sahar is that it allows the um, branching out into support networks um, and we've met a lot of uh, BAME individuals and women of color and women from different organizations who share our like ethos, who share our worldview, and it's just really uplifting to be able to reach out to them. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, so it's allowed us to foster collaborative efforts with several organizations which have similar goals regarding decolonizing STEM and making it more inclusive. Uh, one particular um, group that we've reached out to and that I've reached out to us and that we've met up with um, is called BARC, which stands for uh, Building an Anti-Racist Classroom. And it's an international collective of women of color activists and scholars which aim to fight systemic racism and misogyny and misogynoir in academic institutions. I highly recommend following them um, on Twitter and checking out some of their resources. Uh, it's also allowed us to make connections with influential women of color scientists, so some of whom we've actually interviewed for our podcast, um, one of which is Professor Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who is a cosmologist and a core faculty member in the Department of Women and Gender Studies at the University of New Hampshire. It was actually her who recommended that we write for Physics World, and it shows the power of making um, of, make, of uh, making connections in whichever minority groups you may be in. It allows, that, allows for there to be a support network and a system through which you can feel uh, included and supported and, and sort of lifted up, which is ultimately what we hope we've done with you guys by giving this talk today. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the end of uh, my section. Um, I think I'll pass it back over to Abby for questions and stuff.